the assembly for the month. So <laughs> go ahead and mark that off your to-do list. You are officially covered. <laughs> I love, I love to laugh in the presence of God. I love to have joy. The Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 8 that the joy of the Lord is my strength, which means that we should draw strength and joy in the presence of God. We should be excited when we leave. We should be expectant while we're here, and we should be hungry as we continue to move and develop in the things of God. I believe that this gathering, the corporate gathering, the Sunday morning service, should be a mix of praise and worship and revelation and also it should spark you to push further, to go higher, to dig deeper uh, into the things of God. And so I'm hoping that in the next few moments that I have with you, we will accomplish those goals. I'm grateful Pastor Marty has allowed me to be a part of this Sunday morning experience here. And uh, grateful to Josh Mayo for the initial invitation last year to be a part of the Genesis Conference. I was greatly impacted by what I saw here last year because this is Fort Smith, Arkansas, and you don't expect to see 2,000 kids going crazy for Jesus from all different backgrounds in Fort Smith, Arkansas. If I can just be honest, what I saw here was a rare thing. You would expect a gathering like that in a much larger church city, maybe with a couple million people. You see 2,000, but 2,000 in Fort Smith is like 50,000 in Atlanta. You need to know that you are on the cutting edge of what God is doing and you are to be celebrated for it harvest time. You need to make some noise for Jesus and for yourself because you're pretty amazing. I do want to make one suggestion to the executive committee. Can you have more fat praise and worship songs? What I mean by that is all the songs are for skinny kids and their We are running. I could do that for six seconds. After that, I'm back to being fat. I thank God for Pastor Marty. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to the little cowardly lion there. I needed that. Sometimes I just need to stand still. See, me and this guy, he's got the camera. We look like, that looks like our, our Mexican brother. I'm black, white, Mexican. We all big. Shout out to all the big people, because, you know, all the worship. And then you see, you know, Pastor Greg, first of all, you did a great job. You and your team are to be commended for everything you do, man. Give it up again, <laughs> Pastor Greg. You know, and I told Pastor Greg yesterday, he gets on my nerves because he's so anointed and he's so gifted. And then he's like, you know, all in shape and his hair is all Justin Bieber. And he's like, you know, God just wants to bless you. And God, God just loves you. And it's just amazing. And, you know, sick of it. But, <laughs> but I, I celebrate him and I celebrate what God has done in him. And, uh, you know, I, I want to share uh, something that the Lord gave me. It's different from the first service. do want to let you know that after this service, I'll be hanging out in the lobby because I want to meet y'all and hang out for a second because we're family. Whether you know it or not, we are connected. We are family. The same blood that was applied to your life was applied to my life. The blood of Jesus causes us to be unified. We are the body of Christ, which means we are blood-related. Now, I know that scares you because you didn't know you had a Negro in the family. <laughs> But it's Black History Month, so you might as well find out. <laughs> Put me on your Christmas card. Scare the neighbors. Hey, Earl, who's the black guy? Hey, he's my brother. I just found out. <laughs> I didn't even know. Because I didn't even know. I didn't even know. Okay. So. <laughs> well, I've got a comedy DVD. The comedy DVD is called Laughter in Black and White. And what I did in that DVD is I brought together what I believe are the best traditions of the black and the white church. And I made fun of all the stuff that divides us. And I, I made an open mockery of the devil because he's tried so hard to keep us separated. And I decided we're going to laugh about it. And we're going to celebrate our diversity. We're going to celebrate. We're not going to make anybody feel bad about anything. We're all the family of Christ. We're the body of Christ. And in one of the stories on the DVD, I talk about going on a hunting trip with my pastor. He's a white pastor, southern preacher, and we went hunting. Now, I was the only black face. I said, what are we hunting? I just, I just need to know. Normally, this don't work out well, but I'm just, 
<laughs> you want to get that DVD? I am honored to say I'm the first Christian DVD, uh, comedy DVD, to be on the shelves at Walmart. They, gave, they took a chance on me, and I thank God I made history there, and I praise God, but I have some of those available. So if you want to grab that, it's for the whole family. Your kids can watch it. You don't have to delete or bleep or fast forward. I believe in honoring God with my gift. So if you want to grab that, it would really bless me because I got diapers to buy for two kids. Help me, please, Jesus. Um, I love this church. I love what God is doing. Uh, the first service, I noticed the multi-generational aspect. We've got people from different backgrounds, different walks of life. This room is very offensive to hell because the devil has tried so hard to separate us by race. Let's just be honest. Let's get it out of the room. Let's just get the big gorilla in the corner and bring him on out. The devil wants to separate us by what we look like. I'm mixed, so just understand. I'm black and I'm white, so I can roll either way. It don't matter if you're black or white. Diddle, 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 diddle. That really hurt because I'm big. Okay. <laughs> but looking in this room, you see black, you see white, you see Hispanic, you see Mexican, you see Native American, all of these different backgrounds. And the only color that matters is red. It's the blood of Jesus. And that's what unifies us. Let's just celebrate that. Sitting in this room, Pastor Marty, and I'm fascinated by all of the people that are here, but I'm also trying to figure out who wouldn't want to be a part of something like this. You know, according to the latest research polls, more people doubt and don't attend church than do. For the first time in history, more people in the generation that's represented in the Genesis Conference, according to the latest Pew Research polls, there are more young people, 39 million, out of that group, there's a higher percentage that don't believe in God than do. For the first time in history. What does that say about us as parents? as grandparents, as caregivers, as aunts and uncles. I want us to pray about that. We're losing a generation. How did that happen on our watch? How did we lose a generation? Well, guess what? There's 2,000 in here over the weekend. Apparently, y'all are saying, I don't care about research polls. We're going to get Jesus to our young people. And that is a phenomenal thing. But we need this all over the country to be reproduced trying to figure out what it is that causes people not to pack out every service every time the doors of the church are open. I mean, let's be honest. We got an amazing message. Love, forgiveness, acceptance, reconciliation, healing, miracles, signs, wonders, diversity. We got good food. I got coffee shops. We got all kinds of stuff going on, barbecues, men's ministry, women's ministry. You got the worship team. You got guitars. Who wouldn't want to be a part of this? This is amazing. And look at you. Who wouldn't want to sit next to you? Because you're pretty amazing right there in your quality seat. You smell good. You have on your premium deodorant. You've got on your nice makeup, top quality ties and shirts. You look great. Why? Why? Are those numbers like they are? Why aren't people flocking to church? What is the problem? Well, I think I found our problem. And I want to talk about it today because there's nobody who doesn't want love. Everybody wants love. Everybody wants forgiveness. Nobody wants judgment. And we've got it right here. We've got it. We've got the great message. We've got the right facilities, the right resources. How come people don't go to church? How come it's like pulling teeth? What is the problem? And I have a scripture here. I'd like you to travel with me to Matthew chapter 21. Matthew 
And I actually want you to start at the sixth verse. The sixth verse. I'm reading from the New King James Version. It says, so the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. They brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and set him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitudes who went before and those who followed cry out, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he had come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Then Jesus went into the temple of God and drove out all those who bought and sold in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests And scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying out in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant and said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants? You have perfected praise. Then he left them and went out of the city to Bethany and he lodged there. And I want you to know that I found our problem. We got a problem, and our problem's name is Jesus. What I want to talk to you about for a few minutes is the problem with Jesus. Stay with me for a moment. I don't want you to get offended by my title. I want you to hear what I have to say. The problem with Jesus. Lord, meet us in this moment. Speak to us according to your word that we are transformed not by the words but by your spirit in the words. In Jesus' name, amen. In this scripture, we see Jesus coming into the city a week before his crucifixion. And he gave his disciples specific instructions on what to do and how to do it. He said, listen, I'm getting ready to go into the city. I need you to get me a colt, a colt that has never been ridden on. I want you to get it. If they ask what's going on, tell them the Lord, excuse me, the Lord has need of it. The disciples go, get the colt, bring it to Jesus. They put their clothes on him. They put Jesus on it, and he begins to go down the hill into the city. People go crazy. They start screaming and shouting because for three years they've been waiting on Jesus to make a move because Jesus had been doing miracles. I'm not talking about just, you know, you had a cold and he prayed for it. I'm talking you had a dead kid and that kid got out of that coffin. I'm talking about you were lowered down through a roof and you were paralyzed and you got up walking with your mat in your hand. I'm talking about leprosy like you came out of the thriller video and God healed you. I'm talking about miracles, deaf ears being open. Can you hear me now? I'm talking about blinded eyes. Oh my shady, I'm, uh, I'm talking about miracles. This Jesus was coming into the city on a cult that had never been ridden on and the city was buzzing with anticipation. Finally, this Jesus that we've been seeing doing these miracles, signs, and wonders is going to deliver the nation of Israel from the oppression of the Romans. He's going to free us, and we're going to establish a political rule. And those who have been sticking it to us, now we're going to stick it to them. Yeah, here comes our leader. Here comes our warrior. Here he comes, and now y'all in trouble. (laughs) Ha-ha, because here comes Jeezy. Holler at me and that's in the NIV version that's the Negro International version that's not in your Bible you can buy it in the lobby holler at me the problem is that everybody got it wrong 
And what they did then is what we do now. Pastor Marty, so many people want Jesus to be what they want him to be. But the problem with the church is that Jesus doesn't change. The problem with today's church is that we want Jesus to become something other than what he is. We love church. We love the concept of God. Everybody loves the concept of God. Everybody loves the concept of somebody that loves them unconditionally, has forgiveness for them, has answered prayers, but the problem becomes Jesus. Because when you put Jesus in the equation, now you've got to deal with a concept of God in the form of a man. And too many people want to keep their Jesus way up here when Jesus came right here. Jesus wants to face you and he wants you to see him for what he is, but also for what he's not. And the people who were saying, Hosanna to the son of David, the word Hosanna, young people, means save now. That means, God, get me out of my situation. Get me out of my political circumstance. Get me out of my bad family life. Get me out of my bad community. And Jesus said, no, once you get the revelation of who I am, I'm not going to get you out of any of that. I'm just going to give you a fresh perspective while you walk through it. It's real quiet in this Presbyterian church. (laughs) Jesus is the problem with the church because Jesus will not conform to what we want him to be. He stands as the truth of God. For it says in the book of Hebrew, behold, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do your will, O God. For Jesus Christ is not a political figure. He is the son of the living God. And let me make this clear in harvest time, because I know you don't know me and you're trying to figure me out, but I only got 10 minutes left. You don't have time to figure me out. Just trust that I love God like you. But just in case you don't know, let me tell you what I think about Jesus. I believe he's the son of the living God. I believe he's the first begotten of the dead. I believe that he was born of a virgin named Mary. I believe that he's coming back for a church without spot or wrinkle. I believe Jesus is the only way to the Father. I believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe that his blood was enough to make me right with the Father. I believe that if I call on his name, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I believe that I had no shot with God until Jesus died on that cross. And I believe Jesus wasn't a white man. He wasn't a black man. He wasn't an Indian man. He was a Jewish man. But his blood was enough to save me beyond my culture, beyond my background, beyond my past. Jesus saves to the utmost. Most Jesus saves. Somebody needs to give God a praise this morning. Come on in here, make some noise. We have politicized Jesus, but he is not a political figure. He is the central figure in history. He is a problem for those who don't believe. We've got scientists who doubt the validity of God. How can you doubt the validity of God if you take physical matter at its smallest individual ability to be cut down in and of itself it has no reason to exist if you cut the physical universe down to its smallest component there is no reason sir for it to exist on its own there has to be some order somewhere there's got to be an intelligent design somewhere scientists believe that nothing created something but nothing is in charge of all of these somethings when the bible clearly says the heavens declare the glory of God. He makes stars for fun, threw them up in the universe and named each one of them and then he created planets and then he created us in his image and of all the things he created the only one that he breathed into was you and me. We are the ultimate of God's creation. We are the original intent of heaven. We are the express design of God. When he breathed into you, he broke the mold. He said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and the power of God rests in you right here in Arkansas and in Oklahoma or wherever you live so much power is in you that wherever you walk you possess the land wherever you step God gives
gives it to you when the devil sees you come and he runs the other way. That's how much power you have. I feel the Holy Ghost in here and I don't need any help. I'm going to praise him by myself. Y'all excuse me for about five seconds while I give God praise. I wish somebody would join me and come out of your comfort zone. You don't have to stop because I'm talking about your God. You don't have to stop praising because I'm talking about your king. We get more excited for a sports team than our God. How dare we shout more for a Razorback than a God who has our back? How dare we shout more for sports and Oklahoma City Thunder than the one who created the lightning and the thunder? How dare we make more noise for other things than the God that saved us? People say, people say, well, I'm not a loud person. Yes, you are. You're loud when you want to be. You're passionate about what matters to you. When you're passionate about something, you're not quiet about it. If you're passionate about it, you make noise about it. When you love somebody, you let them know about it. And when you love something, you tell people. If you really love Jesus, I invite you to tell somebody about him. I invite you to invite somebody to church. Jesus is the problem with the church. Because the church was founded upon Jesus, but many churches have left Jesus for their own agenda. They want to be seeker sensitive, which is a nice way of saying they don't want to talk about sin. And let me tell you something. If Jesus didn't die for sin, there ain't no reason for us to be here because I don't need a life coach. I need somebody that'll save me from my sin. I need somebody that'll keep me from the fires of hell. I need somebody that saved my soul. I don't know about you, but I didn't have any hope without Jesus. I was lost without Jesus. I needed him to save me. But Josh, there's a problem with Jesus. People want him to be a political figure. They want Jesus to be a, the Messiah in the earth. But he said in his trial, my kingdom's not of this world. If it were, I'd have my soldiers come handle y'all. And even now, I could call them down. They, them poor soldiers had no clue. All he had to do was call down legions of angels. They would have tore them. Ooh, it would have been a mess. Jesus said, I've got to do this so all my brothers and sisters can be free, free to worship their father. Because when he was ascending, he said, I'm going to your father and my father, your God and my God. He put us on equal footing with himself. But the problem is many people in the church don't believe that. We don't know the power we have, the access we have, the favor we have. There's a problem with Jesus. People love God, but they don't want to hear about Jesus. Jesus is offensive. We even got political leaders. They say that they're Christian, but they don't want Jesus on the money. Want Ten Commandments off the courthouse. You can't pray here, can't pray there. Don't want people to pray for him at inaugurations and such. Please forgive me. Let me tell you something. This is a Christian nation. It was rooted in Christian principles founded on the Bible and whether you want to admit it or not doesn't change what it is blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord take it how you want to I'm tired of the church being quiet about what the Bible is loud about the Bible is still right the problem with the church is Jesus because Jesus is truth and you cannot manipulate truth. You can't get around truth. You can't cut away at truth. It just is what it is. Even people that don't believe in Jesus are living in his day. This is February 9th, 10th. 
February 9, 2013 A.D. Anno Domini in the year of our Lord. Even if you don't believe in him, you're living in his day. Even if you don't want to acknowledge him, everything in history is either before him or after him. Don't tell me Jesus wasn't an original baller and a shot caller. You don't even have to believe in him, but his birth is the mark of history. Everything happened before him or after him. I feel the Holy Ghost. Can I say Holy Ghost at harvest time? Can I shout like I feel it? Can I act a, a Holy Ghost crazy mess in here? Can I go hog wild? Pig suey, baby. Somebody say the problem with Jesus problem with Jesus is that Jesus trusted, trusted people that political religious leaders wouldn't trust. One of the problems with Jesus is who he trusted. If you're going to build a church, you should probably get professional religious people. Jesus knew all the rabbis, all the Pharisees, but who did he choose to build the church? Fishermen, I'm going to build the most unstoppable force the world has ever seen. And I'm going to choose some guys that know how to get up early in the morning and stay out till late at night. Don't mind getting their hands dirty. Don't mind a little bit of hard work. Don't care about the cosmetics. Just don't mind getting in the ground and getting on the floor and getting in the boat and staying until the job is done. Jesus said, I don't want no pretty boys on my team. I ain't got time for fancy pants. I need some real men around me. Give me some grown men, know how to put on some steel toe boots, know how to put on some Wrangler jeans and a nice you know, flannel shirt, knows how to get up, get a cup of black coffee in the morning, kiss his wife goodbye, get out there and work hard, take care of them kids, raise their family right, knows how to come home at night, kiss his wife, baby, how was your day? Eat dinner, pray over your family, watch Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy if you want to, and then go ahead, come to Wednesday night service, show up on the weekend, volunteer in the parking lot, show up and volunteer as an usher. God is saying, I'm looking for some team members, not some pretty boys. I need somebody to give God praise. I want you to shout like you've lost your mind right now, right now. The problem with Jesus is that we've tried to minimize his authority. We want him to be less than what he is, ma'am. We want Jesus to play by our rules, but Jesus won't play by our rules because Jesus is not just a man. He is also God. I'm going to say it again for anybody who forgot that we're not just here having life class. We're here because we are the church, a supernatural move of God. We believe in invisible things like heaven and angels and answered prayers and miracles and signs and wonders. I believe in Jesus. And let me tell you something. The problem is that people don't know what Jesus is. Is he a man? Is he God? Is he a prophet? Where is he from? Is it from Bethlehem in Judea? Is it Nazareth? Is it Galilee? We don't know let me tell you something Mary was a virgin when what was conceived in her was of the Holy Ghost Joseph was the rightful heir to the throne of David Jesus had to come through the line of David the rightful heir to the throne of David to fulfill every prophecy 1500 years of prophecy 66 books multiple writers the Bible is the only religious book in the world that has this level of transparency and authentication no other book in the world can boast what this book can boast don't you tell me this is just something to do we are a part of a supernatural move of God and Jesus is the head of the church Jesus at the center of it all Jesus at the center of it all I'm preaching better than you're shouting the problem with Jesus is that he rode into the city on a colt that had never been ridden on. Anybody here ride horses? Let me see. Now, let me ask somebody. I need you to talk back. Is it wise to ride a horse that's never been ridden on? Why? It hasn't been broken. 
Let me tell you something, and I feel the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, get me a coat that's never been written on. What he's saying is, give me something that has been unfettered by the touch of man. Give me something that I can ride in on that will allow me to break it. That's this Genesis generation. You are the wild cult that God wants to walk in on. God says, give me a wild generation. Give me a crazy generation. Let me ride into my destiny with a generation that's willing to let me be who I am. Let this generation be free to worship at the front of the altar without us staring at them, saying, that don't take all that. Yes, it does. For them, they need it. Maybe we didn't need it, but they need it. Let them get to Jesus. Don't stop them. Let them praise God. Let them shout. Let them jump. Let them clap. As long as they're preaching Jesus, as long as they're singing Jesus, as long as they're calling out to Jesus, leave them alone. Let them get to Jesus. Jesus said, I'm coming in on a wild coat. That means get ready for a wild ride. Need to write that down. Because Jesus is getting ready to take this generation on a wild ride. He's going to show you miracles, signs, and wonders. He's going to show you things about his character. He's going to show you things about his power. He's going to show you things about his glory. He's going to show you things about his nature that you have never seen and the world has never seen. The Bible says greater works will you do than these. God is getting ready to allow some of y'all to walk in the power of healing where you walk past people and put your hand on them. You won't even have to pray, but the power of God that's in you will heal the cancer that was in you. In them. I'm telling you that God wants to show up in this Genesis generation. He wants to ride in on a wild generation. Is anybody willing to be a part of the wild generation? We got two. Anybody else? Three, four. And you don't have to be young. I'm talking to the grandmas and the grandpas too. We need some young at heart folk gray hair with a green spirit. We need some people that will serve God wherever you are, no matter your age, no matter your background, no matter what you have or don't have. God says, I want to use you. I want to use you. I want to use you. I want to use your gifts, your call, your talent, your resources. Uh-oh, the band is coming. I guess that means it's time for me to go. Don't y'all play nothing. I'm not finished yet. I want to keep preaching. I feel the Holy Ghost. I feel the Holy Ghost. I'll call for you in a minute. Is it all right if I preach just a few more moments? Because of my schedule, I don't know when I'll be able to come back. But let me just pause in the middle of my sermon to tell you that this church is awesome, that you all are some awesome people. And it is an honor to be here this morning with you, Harvest Time. This is salt of the earth. This truly is God's country. And I thank God for you. And I speak life to you. And I praise God. Your passion has already blessed me. Thank God for this church. Thank God for what he's doing in this congregation. You are in the right church at the right time, at the right moment. And I prophesy over this church right now that you will see the greatest days of your life, that God unlocks your destiny, that he unlocks your purpose. For business owners in this room, this will be the greatest year in the history of your business. Unprecedented contracts, open doors, unexpected phone calls, business alliances, opportunities. I speak favor over people who have investments, people who have oil and gas and natural gas. I pray that God will open up doors, that people will be blessed in this church beyond their wildest dreams. I declare Ephesians 3.20 over you. Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all you could ask or think according to the power that's working in you. I speak it into your life. If I be a man of God, these words will not fall to the ground.
And I further speak supernatural health and healing over anybody in here who's been battling through sickness. I cancel and I bind up cancer, every form of blood disease, every issue in arthritis, diabetes, heart problems, issues in your lungs, liver, pancreas, healing to your body. When Jesus died on the cross, he didn't just die for your sins, he died for your health as well. Isaiah declared it that he was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I speak to the creative geniuses in this room, the creatives in the room, the artistic and creative gifts, the writers, the singers, the speakers, the app developers, those who have creative ideas for film and TV and movie, the authors who are in this room. I speak that this is the banner year, the year of unlocking, the year of the open door. According to Revelations chapter 3, behold, I set before you an open door that no man can shut. Stop knocking on closed doors. That's not your door. Your door is the open door. God himself is going to open it. I wish I had somebody who will pray with me and give God a great praise. Please forgive me for going beyond my scheduled time. But Jesus, we need more Jesus. Can I just say his name again? We need more Jesus. We need more Jesus in our schools. We need more Jesus on our jobs. All of these crazy mass shootings and killings. Let me tell you something. Parents, they may not allow you to pray in the school, but they can't stop you from going to see your child. And while you're in there, have a little oil on your hand and just walk down the hall and put some oil all over them doors and on them lockers and declare the protection of God all over that school. They can't stop you from doing that. I dare you to declare the Passover over your children. Devil, you can't have this school. You can't have this team. You can't have this neighborhood. You can't have this community. You can't have this city. You can't have this mall. You can't have this restaurant. You can't have nothing in Fort Smith. You can't have nothing in this city. Jesus wants to use a wild generation. He wants to use an unorthodox and unconventional generation to change the way people see who he is. We have limited his power. If you read in Matthew this scripture, as Jesus was coming into the city, the Pharisee said, listen to him, they're praising you. Jesus said, if they don't praise, the rocks will cry out. The word rocks there is a derivation of the word Petros, which is what Jesus called Peter when he founded the church. The revelation is, even if you don't allow those who have responded to my grace to to praise me, those who are under the law will still praise me. Whether it's the law or grace, it all points to Jesus. Jesus is saying, I am the fulfillment of your dreams. I'm the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And Jesus is the problem with the church. Our problem, you can be seated for the two minutes I have left. Our problem is we waver, we wonder, and we worry. Many of us, we come to church, but we still worry. Do you know if you came in here and worship today, you don't have a legal right to worry? It's illegal to worry. Stop worrying about your life. Oh my goodness, how am I going to pay the bills? That ain't your job to worry. The Bible says in Matthew that he he knows what you have need of before you ask. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. If you focus on the things of God, he'll focus on the things concerning you. Stop worrying about stuff you can't change. Stop stressing about how's college going to get paid for and how am I going to make ends meet. God knows you need gas in the car. God sees those bills on the brown 
kitchen table. God's going to take care of you. Has he ever left you? Has he ever not provided? Has he ever not given you what you needed? Maybe you don't have everything you want, but none of us have everything we want. But everybody in here has what we need because it's clear I have not missed a meal no matter what other things might be lacking. God has provided food, clothing, and shelter, and I've got my mind. And as long as I've got my mind and I've got a confession of Jesus in my mouth, I've got a chance to make a difference. Stop wavering between two opinions. Joshua said, if God is God, then serve him. If it's the foreign gods of the nations, we're overtaken, then serve them. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Don't waver anymore. Make your decision today to give Jesus everything. To the great men in this room who are raising their children to know the Lord, don't you ever be quiet about Jesus. You keep telling your kids about Jesus. You have Bible study with them, even if they don't want to hear it. The Bible says train them up in the way they should go, that when they get old, they won't depart from it. They may not respond today, but you sow that seed, and eventually life will water it, and they'll come running back to Jesus. Don't you give up on your kids, sir. You keep praying over your family. Keep praying over that boy. God's going to bring him around. The Bible says sometimes we waver. Our faith gets weary. Sometimes we wonder, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. Sometimes we make bad decisions. But the problem with Jesus is he'll leave 99 and go get one. See, if it was us, we'd say, hey, we got a majority, that's enough. God says, I'm going after the one that everybody else says there's no hope. Thank God, because whether you know it or not, we were each one of that. We were the one. We were the one without hope. We were lost, had no chance with God. And Jesus came to save us. Sometimes we waver. Sometimes we wonder. And sometimes we worry. Stop worrying. The problem with Jesus is he's not going to leave you alone. No matter what you do, he just is relentless. He's going to pursue you. He's going to love you. He's going to keep forgiving you. He's going to keep covering you. He's going to keep protecting you. The problem with Jesus is he won't stop. Even though it's been 2,000 years since he was on the cross, his blood still speaks. His blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel. I feel the Holy Ghost. God will not stop pursuing you harvest time. And I know my time is up. And please forgive me for all of this extra stuff. But I had to come here to tell you that the problem with the church is Jesus. And our problem is also our solution. Our solution is Jesus. He's the great equalizer. He's the finishing point to the equation. He's the answer to our question. He's the answer to the riddle. He's a problem for the devil. He's a problem for hell. He's a problem for disease. He's a problem for sickness. He's a problem for doubters. He's a problem for whisperers and backbiters. He's a problem for everybody who says he's not real because he lived and everybody knows it. That Jesus lived is a matter of historical record. That Jesus lives is a statement of your personal faith. This day, find out where Jesus is in your life. If Jesus is the solution to your issues, you just became a problem for the devil. And may each one of us cause the devil to pull his hair out. May we live a life so committed to God that they throw a party on the day of our funeral in hell because finally we couldn't get him out of here. But too bad for them, you live such a great life that you left seeds all over the earth and multiplied yourself. So the moment you left, your anointing increased. Come on up. If you don't come now, we'll be here till 1245. <laughs> I'm very grateful for this opportunity. And I hope that you heard my heart. I hope that I didn't offend you by yelling and jumping around and sweating. It's these hot lights. I've lost 30 pounds. I feel like a rotisserie chicken. Who wants dark meat? <laughs> Just slice it off the side. I feel like I'm at Boston Market. What in the world? That's your son. 
How old is he? 12? 12 is a significant number, young man. It's normally when in ancient Israel history, a boy becomes a man. 12 is also the number of government and order and structure in the Bible. 12 was the tribes of Israel. 12, the number of disciples that Jesus had. There are 12 gates to the new Jerusalem. Three on the east, three on the west, three on the north, and three on the south. There is a significance to 12, and there's a promise in 2013. 2013 is the year of promise for you, that you will walk out the power that God has placed in you. I know you may not understand everything I'm saying right now, but one day you're going to remember that this really large, bald, black dude said some really cool things to you. And I want to tell you that you're amazing. I want to celebrate you that at 12 years old, when you could be playing video games on your PSP, you're listening to me talk about Jesus. Because you will find out that what I'm saying right now is more important than anything else you'll ever do in your life. Always honor your mama. Honor your dad. The Bible says honor your father and mother, which is the first command with the promise that it'll go well with you and your days will be long on the earth. Sometimes you won't agree with them, but it don't change nothing. They paying the bills and they had you, so you better listen. I speak to this generation that you will live a holy life, that you will serve God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Don't let anybody talk you out of your faith. Don't apologize for loving Jesus. Live a holy life when nobody's looking so you have integrity and power when everybody's looking. Don't you ever quiet your voice. You be the wild generation that Jesus can ride in on. Let Jesus use your heart, your worship, your gifts, your talent to win a generation to Christ. We're living in wicked times when people don't want to hear truth. And even the church is afraid to talk about Jesus. But you don't compromise. And don't you be quiet about Jesus. He is the only hope of the world. He is the savior of men's souls. He is the answer to every problem in life. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the son of the living God. And he is coming back again. And he will crack the sky at the last trumpet sound. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And those that remain will be caught up to meet him in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Comfort one another with these words. If you would be kind enough to stand with me, forgive me for these tears. I don't often cry, but I'm emotional this morning because I believe that God is doing something significant in this generation. And my prayer is that you will Hold Jesus dear to your heart. That you don't let him go. Because the problem with the world is that we want to minimize Jesus, but we need to maximize Jesus. We don't need to talk less about him. We need to talk more about him. We need to shout his name from the mountaintops. Jesus saved. Some of you, you don't even know why you just feel led to get here. Then just come. No form, no fashion. If you feel like God is calling you closer, then just come. It ain't about salvation. This is just about relationship. If you feel God saying, that's you, you're a solution to a demonic problem. You know God wants to unlock destiny. I know this is an unconventional service. Please don't leave if you don't have to unless you got to go to work. Let's just stay the extra three minutes. We're all family here. Thank you for this opportunity, Pastor Marty. I hope that I did not overstep my bounds. But it is my great prayer for this generation and for this great church that after this Sunday, you'll go home and see your life from a different perspective. That the issues of your life pale in comparison to the destiny that you're called to walk out. May you realize today that you are loved, that you are celebrated, and that God is proud of you. And he knows your name, and he knows where you are. And there is a destiny with your name on it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you. 
May the Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before his presence with exceeding joy. To the only wise God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forevermore. The Lord meet every need you have. May your week be marked by the miraculous. May you be overtaken with the presence of the living God. And as of this moment, may your life never be the same. This is my prayer. As your brother in Christ and your co-laborer in the gospel.